great crowds turn out in Copenhagen to cheer King Christian of Denmark on his 75th birthday. A living symbol of Danish resistance all through Nazi occupation, King Christian receives the cheers of his loyal countrymen. Tense emotion for the Danish king. The free progressive people of Denmark have united under his leadership in peace as they did in war. Berlin. The German capital faces its first peacetime winter and reaps the consequences of Nazi aggression. Millions will go without fuel or electricity, and food shortages are growing worse. This, today, is the capital city of the completely defeated enemy. Among the ruins, the homeless live as best they can. Former Nazis must help rebuild the city. Motion pictures that had been banned in Hitler Germany are now permitted. German men and women who once lived off the spoils of Europe are themselves reduced to foraging for food and fuel. shattered Berlin prepares for winter, a bitter ending for the Nazi new order that Hitler said would last a thousand years. The people of France conduct their first free national election in nine years to choose a representative National Assembly and decide on a new constitution. Women vote for the first time in a national contest as a new French Republic, the fourth, rises from the ruins of war. Voting, too, are soldiers. One ballot box is for assembly candidates the other for a referendum on the Constitution and on the French government's temporary powers. Among 24 million voters are famed pre-war figures like former Premier Paul Reynaud, waiting at the end of this line. Edouard Ariot, head of the Radical Socialists. Leon Blum, Socialist Party chief, casts his vote. By an overwhelming majority, France elects an assembly of the left, orders it to write a new constitution, and grants for the interim strong powers to the French government headed by de Gaulle. The world's mightiest mortar, the 36-inch United States Army field piece named the Little David. Completed too late for actual combat, the cannon reveals its power in army tests. The Little David hurls two-ton shells a distance of eight miles and was designed to rip apart the heaviest concrete defenses. It is fired by remote control. Reinforced concrete bulwarks like those which once guarded Japan and Germany are smashed. Another hit. The Little David's 4,000-pound missile digs out a crater 22 feet deep 
and 38 feet across, a mighty allied weapon that it was never necessary to use. From London, by air, comes 14-month-old Michael Sean Collins to his grandparents' home in America, a 4,500-mile trip. Michael's father is an American soldier still on duty in England. His English mother died last July. Michael's grandmother and grandfather meet him, and the airline's hostess turns him over to their care. At home in Stillwater, Minnesota, the much-traveled baby has a big welcoming party with presents and a war bond from his grandmother. Young Michael is well cared for while he waits for the return of his soldier father. Crowds of cheering Chinese hail their liberation in Peiping, centuries-old capital city of Manchu, China. Overrun by Japanese invaders in 1937, Peiping is now freed. In one of the palaces of Peiping's interior forbidden city, the enemy surrenders its garrison. Japan loses the last fruits of her early conquest. Ceremonial samurai swords are collected from the Japanese officers. Their defeat today is complete. The hated Japanese commandant signs surrender terms in behalf of his defeated nation. General Sun Lian Ching, commander of China's 11th war zone, signs for the national government. The enemy salutes his captor. The Japanese, now prisoners of war, are marched away. The Chinese representatives leave the palace as their countrymen hail the day of victory. Venerable Pei Ping, eight years under Japan's heel, belongs to China once more. Washington, Prime Minister Clement R. Attlee arrives from England and is welcomed by Secretary of State Burns. At the White House, Mr. Attlee sees President Truman for the first time since the Potsdam Conference. Their meeting will deal with world affairs, with particular emphasis on the control of atomic energy. At Arlington Cemetery with Prime Minister King of Canada, Truman and Attlee pay tribute to the unknown soldier of World War I. Today, millions of new dead lie in new graves because the last armistice failed to build a lasting peace. A heavy responsibility faces those who plan the future. The three leaders board the yacht Sequoia to begin discussions. Representatives of the three nations which perfected the atomic bomb weigh the grave problems connected with its future control. 